How's it going? In my opinion, one of the most profound aspects of the human condition is nostalgia. And I think the name, or I should say the etymology of it, is lost on a lot of us. Nos is coming from chronos, meaning time. Algia, meaning pain. And when you're young, you do definitely feel a sense of nostalgia, but... Not the algae part, definitely not the pain, but at some point, as you grow older and older, the pain, the algae, becomes a lot more apparent. Baby videos go from being embarrassing and cute to, I don't know, nostalgic, I guess. And it doesn't have to be sad, it doesn't have to be sorrowful, it's just pain. A pain of the passing of time. What if... There was a horror movie out there that predated on this vulnerability in nostalgia. And I think I found the movie. I want to give a quick disclaimer before the video really kicks off. So for the whiteboard segments of this video, my lapel mic crapped out. I tried my best to salvage the audio that got picked up by the mounted mic on my camera, but I just want to give an apologies in advance for the inconsistency in audio quality, and I hope it sounds at least vaguely listenable. Thank you to those who stick around, and of course my apologies to those who have to click off. Before we get started, I want to be absolutely clear. This is not going to be a review video for Skin of Rink. In fact, I'm going to do my best for this to not even be your typical synopsis video. It's going to be an analysis of the plot. And Skin of Rink is a very unique movie in that you really can't have the movie just explained to you before even watching the movie. It's an experience that you sit through, and if you want it to be explained to you, you come to a video like this. But a lot of movies these days, it seems like people are doing it the other way around. This is not the case. I'm actually going to go out of my way to make sure that if you haven't seen this m movie, that you're not going to be able to sort of get away with watching the movie without having to actually go out and watch the movie by watching this video. This is purely going to have value for people who have seen the movie and have already watched it. So if you haven't watched it, please go and do it. And if you do want a review, if you want to make sure you're not wasting your time, let me give you a short review. Skin of Rink is a fantastic movie. And what makes it fantastic is how cruel it is. And when I say cruel, I mean that in a good way. Imagine I have no mouth and I must scream, but in a much more smaller scale. That being said, as much as I really like the movie, I'll have to admit it is unorthodox. The way the story is being told, the way it's being shown, is a very unorthodox means of mechanically keeping the story going. And on top of that, the, the pacing is a very risky slow burn. In fact, to even say it a slow burn, it's just slow. It's not even much of a burn, to be honest with you. So it's very, very risky. However, I'm going to say this. You would think a movie of that kind of quality, or that maintains those qualities, would be an artsy, fartsy, inaccessible movie. But I find that this movie is actually very accessible. Even if you don't know what's going on, it's sights and sounds that are still great to marvel at and get you into the scary, spooky mood. And I think on a secondary watch, when you have an idea now, just how everything pans out, it's cool to decode the, how the plot actually unfolds. So it's definitely a really good movie. That being said, this is not the movie you want to watch. This is not the movie you want to watch while multitasking. Don't be doing your homework. Don't be playing Minecraft. 
try to do your very best to simulate the movie theater experience. Dimly lit room, dark room, you're just focusing on the movie. Turn your phone off, make sure food, drinks, snacks are within reach, empty bladder. You want to give this movie 100% of your uh, attention because there's a lot of lines to read in between. And sometimes we don't want to watch a movie like that. So if that's not something you think you'll be into, then by all means, this is not the movie for you at this time. But if you ever want to decode something and solve a puzzle, watch that movie now. Keep this video in your mind or don't. I don't care. I'd rather you just watch the movie uh, and, and, and prove to you, show yourself how intelligent and wise you can be by being able to decode the movie. And in the end, if you can't, if you just, it is, you, you aren't getting it, don't fret because it is a strange movie. Now, Spoilers ahead, all right? So if you haven't watched the movie, go watch it. It should be on Shudder by the time this is uploaded or by the time you're at least watching this. The title Skinnamarink threw me for a loop. I thought, Skinnamarink? Isn't that one song? Skinnamarinky dinky dink, Skinnamarinky do. And it is in reference to that song. And that's where it ends. That's where the meaning of the title ends. You see, this was a working title that just sort of stuck. And it serves a very specific purpose. That purpose is to be evocative. For those of you who don't know, this song, Skinnamarink, is basically like the baby shark for Canadian children in the 18, 1980s and for American, or I should say United States children in the 1990s. That's me. And I grew up with this song. It's a very nostalgic song. So maybe that allowed me to be more receptive to this movie. You see, the title, Skinnamarink, is evocative of the very same thing that red, plasticky, chunky toys Big blocky VHS sets and TV sets, wood paneling, the popcorny ceiling, drywall, uh, carpet. <laughs> that just liminal haze that just covers every memory in my mind's eye of my early, early, early childhood. The title Skinnamarink is evocative of the same thing that all of those things are evocative of. It takes us to the realm. The realm. The realm of 199. <laughs> the realm of 1995. Before this movie utters a word, a subtitle, a credit, the first word this movie utters is 1995. The first angle we get of this movie is a majority carpet and the bottom of our protagonist's feet and lower legs. This is something, as we get back into this movie again, we're going to get used to again, and that is the very unorthodox way that the movie is shot in. We see them fussing with this kid's tape player, big, chunky, red, plastic tape player, and they're fussing with the buttons, but nothing is playing. They call out for their dad, and not getting any response, they go into his room. Still, nothing. Then they come out of the room, Kevin goes into what I believe is the toy room, and Kaylee goes down the hallway into perhaps her bedroom or maybe to watch some TV downstairs. I have it flipped around. It seems that it's Kaylee who goes into that hallway room, which I believe is the toy room, and Kevin is the one that darts down the hallway. Now, this is probably something you didn't pick up on your first watch of the movie, so I want to establish this now. Which kid is Kaylee? Which kid is Kevin? So Kaylee is the older sister. She's the child that's not wearing any socks. So the barefoot child is Kaylee. Kevin is the younger brother. He's the one wearing socks. You're not going to be seeing a lot of their heads, their bodies, anything. So you really are only going to be identifying them by their, their knees down. So it's of paramount importance if you're ever confused which character is which. Kaylee's wearing like white, white pajamas without any socks. And Kevin is wearing like, I think, blue, blue pant, sweat pant pajamas with socks on. We see Kevin in the toy room throwing blocks and fussing around with toys, passing the time. And as the camera pans up, I believe the filmmakers are sort of implying to us that there is an unseen figure there, or unseen force there stalking over Kevin. I recall looking very hard into this void within the ajar door, really trying to see if I can find a shape, find a figure. And I noticed the figures that I was seeing, the shapes I was seeing, they were just simply tricks being played on my eyes by the graininess of the footage. And that is a convenient little 
benefit to this movie, the entire time your eyes are going to be playing tricks on you. Little imperfections and I don't want to say glitches, but I think they're like markings, like like scars or whatever on the film. They're going to be playing tricks with your eyes. What was that? Did I see something? And that will be just, I think, a lifelong merit to the, how this movie plays out and tells its story. We see a bunch of dark shots of the house, and it is absolutely drenched in this liminal haze that is the film grain. And we'll realize that it just serves to add to the tone and the dreamlike nature of this movie. These shots lead us to the father's room. But before we go to there, I want to point out a couple of things. We hear a TV going on and the room is being lit up by the light of the television and then it suddenly turns off. I'm assuming that this is Kaylee watching TV and I don't think we're at the point yet in the movie where it's the monster turning things off and manipulating things. I think because she's the older sister, she's the older sibling, she's more responsible, she turns off the TV on her own and goes to bed. And then we see a picture of what I assume to be an adult female, likely the mother, and her face is just obscured by both the darkness and that liminal haze of the film grain, and there's just something eerily familiar about her. If you've watched this movie before, which you should have, it should be very familiar, the, the, the way her face looks, and I'm not referring to Kaylee's ultimate fate. Think of another face obscured in darkness, featureless. But now we see the dad sleeping, notably in a queen-sized bed, with nobody sleeping alongside with him. We'll discuss why this is as we pick up on more evidence and data points, but I'll say right now, I believe the mother to have passed away at some point before this movie. But now we have our answer. The reason why the father didn't respond in the previous scene was not because he wasn't there, but because he was in such a deep sleep. Meanwhile, unlike father, Kevin is fussing and fumbling in his bed, he can't sleep, and then he gets out of bed and he makes his way to the hallway. He's sitting in the hallway, just sort of lingering in front of his dad's door. And he's sitting there in the protective glow of the nightlight. Yes, that magical device that's just as effective as crucifixes in the warding off of phantoms and demons alike. In this next scene, we see the linen closet, or the, the, you know, the, the pillow closet, open up by an unseen force. Most likely, this is Kevin. However, the film is getting us used to the way that it's telling its story. We're not seeing events unfold on camera. We're seeing the peripheral consequences of these events on camera. So yeah, it's 95% likely. It's just Kevin's little arm, you know, pulling down the, the blankets. But the way it's shot, the way it looks is so paranormal. It's so eerie. Kevin makes his way to the staircase. And he's either lingering at the top of the staircase or at the midway point. And he's talking to something or someone. An imaginary friend, maybe Kaylee, but I believe this is our antagonist. He's talking to our antagonist. Kevin asks, are you hiding? No response. And Kevin starts counting, kind of like a hide and seek kind of thing. He gets to three and suddenly we hear a thump. Kevin has been pushed down or fell down the stairs. Our point of view has been taken to another part of the house and we can hear Kevin sobbing and screaming in pain due to his fall. And as we get closer, it becomes less and less obscure and it really hits us at our core to hear him in pain like that. Now finally, the father is awake. He's walking through the hallway, leaving rooms lit by the lights as he's turning them on in his, in his path. He tends to Kevin and then suddenly the sobbing stops. We hear a car door close and it, the car engine starting and a car driving off. We're hearing all this, we're not seeing this. The camera is panning around the house, letting us take in that 90s Kino, that 1995 Kino. And then suddenly, we land on the VHS and the TV and it turns on. Now, this could be Kaylee watching the TV herself, but I think this is our, what are we even gonna call this thing? Monster? Demon? Ghost? Maybe we should call it the Skinnamarink. So anyways, the Skinnamarink is watching the TV. If you listen closely, the theme song that's playing on the television should sound familiar. 
is the theme song for Presto Changeo, that cartoon towards the end of Skinema Rink that shows that bunny that shapeshifts and disappears and whatnot. We'll talk a lot more about him later in this video, but it's pretty important we point out this early motif. Throughout this analysis, I'm going to do my best to help decode and interpret what these cartoons are telling us throughout this movie. We hear how the family start coming back into the house. The Skinnamarink turns the TV off and evades. Because I don't want to say he disappears because he hasn't really appeared to us just yet. We now see the father on the phone with a family member. From this phone conversation, we can pick up on a few data points. Kevin fell down the stairs. Kevin hit his head. Kevin didn't need stitches, he said, so they went to the hospital. And he even mentions how Kaylee told him that Kevin must have been sleepwalking again. So that's actually pretty important because that tells us that Kaylee went on the hospital ride with him or on the car ride to the hospital with them. So I think that's definitive proof that whatever entity was watching the TV while the family was gone had to be the skin of Marink. This is where I think we can really take two different pathways. You see, Kevin, he fell down some stairs. Now, either he's in a coma or dead, and the events now for the rest of this movie are taking place in a dream sequence, or in my school of thought, I believe that what the father says on the phone that you're going to hear him say is all true. He went to the hospital, he was fine, he got cleared, and they got home. And every event that we see take place that happens to Kaylee and Kevin is actually happening to Kaylee and actually happening to Kevin. And it's not just happening to a figment of Kaylee in Kevin's imagination. This is actually happening to Kaylee and to Kevin at the hands of this. Hey, this is my head cannon of what the Skinnamarink looks like, by the way. Well, this is what I think the Skinnamarink wants to look like. Do you see how that, that's like, how he looks like in the ending? But put on, on, a uh, Presto Changeo's body. I'm really proud of that. Kaylee is wandering down the hallway, tiptoeing, and the way she's approaching the situation is very, very cautious. And it's just so brilliant. I mean, we don't see her face, we don't even see her body language, we just see the way she's tiptoeing. And we can tell that she's put off by something. She goes back to her father's room and calls for her father. But again, just like before, he doesn't respond. They just got back from the hospital. He has not entered deep sleep yet. We come to find out that he isn't there. The reason why he hasn't responded is he's gone missing. So because she can't find her dad, she goes to see if she can find Kevin. She goes back down that hallway. She enters this dark corner of a room and then emerges with Kevin. And this is just so, like, I, I, I don't want to draw too many parallels to other forms of media, especially internet forms of media, but this is so, like, backroomsy. I mean, you've heard me say this word liminal a few times already, but it's like she no-clipped into reality with Kevin. I mean, they entered this corner, and then they've emerged from this dark corner. And it's just such a strange, irregular way to pace and show the story. And it, this is, like, one of my favorite just shots in the film. Their father is gone. They try going to the phone, but they can't get any kind of line to connect. The windows are disappearing. The front door has disappeared. So our two protagonists decide to sleep downstairs, have a little bit of a TV slumber party to cope with this dire situation. I would sleep downstairs tonight. What we see is now the cutest part of this movie. We hear Kaylee and Kevin say that they love each other, and it's... It's so sad. Love you. Love you too. This small instance of innocence make what we know that's going to happen later in this movie all the more painful. We have to remind ourselves that this is a story about two children. Many times we see horror movies, there's caricatures of unlikable, crazy, dumb characters, and whatever, right? It's, it's easy just to turn our brains off and enjoy the horror movie and whatever, whatever misfortune they deal with, but it's fine. These are two children, innocent children, and I'm sure a lot of you see yourselves in, a lot, in, in these children very much so, and so there's this, this really sobering reality when you, when you hear, I'm not gonna lie, I teared up when I was watching this in the movies. When you hear Kaylee saying to Kevin, love you, and then Kevin says to Kaylee, love you too. I cry every time. So they fall asleep, and then they wake up on their own. So even in this weird pocket dimension, 
their circadian rhythm is kicking in. Kayla gets a tin box with some food and juice and snacks inside of it, and we see on the television a child not being able to sleep. I think this one's a little bit more of a doozy. I can't really think of anything too deep about this one. I think it's just sort of juxtaposing the image of a child on the TV, not being able to sleep, having trouble sleeping, their circadian rhythm being altered or whatever, and sort of juxtaposing that with our two protagonists. Kaylee splits from the group to go upstairs to grab some things. She gets to the hallway and realizes that the nightlight has inexplicably been pulled out of its socket. Not only that, the room to the toy room, or the, sorry, the door to the toy room is creepily left ajar. So Kaylee calls for her father. After all, who else would have pulled the nightlight out of its socket? Kaylee stands there waiting for a response from her father. She gets nothing, abruptly puts the nightlight back into the wall socket and darts back downstairs. We can all relate to that feeling. But in the darkness, something pulls the nightlight out of its socket again. Kaylee comes back downstairs and reunites with Kevin, and then a light turns off in a nearby room, and they can't seem to turn it back on, despite being able to flick the switch up and down, they can't get it to turn on. We know this is the doing of the skin of a rink, but up until this point, we haven't seen any sort of real dastardly mischief. The TV now depicts two children falling asleep and being transported into this sort of, into the night sky, their souls or their ghosts or their spirit, being transported away from their body into the night sky. And now, listen, I'm of the mind uh, that this is all happening for real, uh, but if you are of the mind that this is happening in a coma dream or in a dream realm, this also very much uh, helps, you know, back that up. But I think this also just sort of symbolizes the transporting into another realm being transported into this very dreamlike liminal realm. We now see Kaylee standing, facing the dark hallway. This hallway, I believe, leads to the stairs that lead upstairs and even lead to the basement, I believe. She hears her mom, whom I don't believe is in the picture anymore, crying. And then we see the TV depict crows having a funeral. I believe this is to tell us, we've heard the crying of the mother and then we hear, or sorry, see, Crow's having a funeral, and I think the movie's trying to tell us that the mother has passed away at some point before this movie, in this family's past. Noises like thumping are heard from upstairs, and the children th sort of stir and are confused and sort of startled by what's going on. Maybe we should just... And I think in this moment of just sort of adapting and just sort of figuring out what's going on, they didn't notice a chair stuck to the kitchen ceiling. What is so chilling is they don't say, what? or did you do that or what's going on or whatever their 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 words are or they, they say the first thing they say is be quiet or like stay quiet or something like that which is so chilling that their instinct is to like <laughs> go stealth mode basically be quiet. now this could just be a chair stuck to the ceiling by the skin of marink as a way of messing with the children and just sort of playing around with the physics of its pocket realm but I think, based on a cartoon we're gonna see later on in the film, I think this is the Skinnamarink prop hunt style, shape-shifted into the chair, hanging from the ceiling, watching down at them. I don't know, maybe I'm just trying to make this movie even scarier than it actually is, but the idea that this is just the Skinnamarink just hanging there, and we see a chair, but you see, you know, that disgusting beast that we see at the end of the movie, staring down at them, it freaks me the heck out. We then hear, I believe, Kevin say, I don't want to talk about mom. So it's obviously a touchy subject. I think that just further backs up the fact that the mother's no longer in the picture because she passed away. The toilet is gone now. This should be the first evidence of the Skinnamarink's detestable evil ways. It's already trapped these children in its little realm, uh, separating them from their home world but that just some seems to not be enough. It removes their ability to go to the bathroom with dignity. So Katie is then investigating the noises. She sees the doll floating or stuck to the ceiling, similar to how the chair was stuck to the ceiling, and then one cheap jump scare later, our protagonist puts some buckets in the bathroom and the TV depicts uh, a child feeding birds. Now this one I'm honestly stuck on. 
It could just simply mean the children are somehow feeding the skinnamarink. It could be maybe a, depicting a child making friends with a dirty animal or a, 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 a beast that it shouldn't be making friends with. I don't know. This one, I'm kind of stuck on. We then see an elaborate Lego scape. We're going to see the Legos be shifted around, and I believe that's sort of to be juxtaposed with the sort of topsy-turvy nature of this house, this new house that they're living in. Kaylee seems to be fixated on this dark hallway. She hears a feminine voice telling her to come upstairs. But despite hearing a feminine voice, she goes to her father's room and sees her father there. No female in sight, at least not yet. Her father, or what looks to be her father, tells her to look under the bed. She looks under the bed, but not long enough. She says it's too dark. She yeah. then is told to try again. She looks under the bed, and in the hardest fake out I've ever experienced, I mean, after that dumb Barbie jump scare, I thought we were gonna get really hit hard, but no, she comes back up from the bottom of the bed. The father is gone, and now we see her mother sitting with her back turned towards her on the other side of the bed. Now, I believe that the reason why the father told her to look under the bed was because the father was not actually the father, but the skin of Marink. And so she needed to avert her eyes away from him so he could quickly shape shift into the mother. The mother is asking Kaylee to avert her eyes, but instead of looking underneath the bed, to close her eyes. Again, another hard fake out, jump scare fake out, but Kaylee closed her eyes, opens them, and the mother is gone. So I believe this shows us the skin of Marink not only has the ability to shape shift, but has the ability to disappear or maybe even teleport itself across different planes. In that same room, there's a connected room to that bedroom. I think that maybe might be like a bathroom, like a master bathroom of some sorts. But I, I, I think we see a shape in the doorway of that, and we hear a sort of struggling version of the mother's voice and cracking and, 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 and gross noises. And we hear the mom or the Skinner Marine pretending to be the mom telling Kaylee to go back downstairs, to get away, to leave, because Kaylee's going to see uh, or, or witness the, the, the sort of the facade be broken. I seem to have misremembered, uh, so there is no shape in the doorway, but uh, there is this shape that comes out of the doorway. I'm assuming a hand or some sort of tendril of sorts or just some sort of appendage of the skinnamarink right before the scene changes. Now, I think it's safe to say at this point, mom and dad are not in the picture anymore. It's all Mr. Skinnamarink. Can you put that on YouTube? I don't know if I can put that on you. I don't know if I can put that on YouTube. There we go. We then hear a screech. The scene ends, and then we see the TV again, depicting a monster tormenting two small creatures, two small little cute creatures. That one's pretty obvious. The monster is the skin of a rink, and the two creatures are Kaylee and Kevin. Now I'm. We are pleasantly surprised to see Kaylee making it back downstairs but she definitely doesn't want to talk about what she saw. So she asks Kevin to help move the couch to help barricade that TV room against whatever beast she saw, which it's not going to help, but it's at least they're trying something. Kevin is curious as to what's gotten Kaylee all shaken, but she doesn't want to tell him what she saw. The Skinnamarink lures Kaylee upstairs, and we see this shot of this like door, you know, in a lit room, and we see this shadow and it looks like a head and shoulders and like a figure. It looks like a person. And I remember this shot in the Skinnamarink trailer and I thought, ooh, that's a creepy looking shot. But maybe it's just my eyes creating shapes where there just isn't anything there. And you can hear Kaylee heavily breathing. We then hear the Skinnamarink refer to Kevin for the first time, asking him to come to the basement. In the basement, we hear Kaylee calling out to Kevin, muffled. I'm scared. I feel strange. We have a point of view of Kevin, and the camera is panning, and we see a sort of obscured Kaylee sitting crisscross applesauce in the basement, and we get hit with a 
eh, quasi-tasteful jump scare of our poor Kaylee with her face. Her eyes have been like, are covered in skin. She still has her nose. I'm assuming she can still breathe, but she can't see and she can't speak. I want to take this moment though to still point out up until this point, Kaylee was more or less a protagonist. It would be very strange, like the main protagonist. It would be very strange that in the movie that's supposed to depict Kevin's dream world, we see a whole lot of things happen with Kaylee. Kaylee is the main character until this point. So I still don't think it's a dream sequence, but I think the movie and the experience is dressed in a very dreamlike way because maybe that's just how the Skinnamarink wants to format its pocket dimension. Kaylee is now Dunzo. She's not dead. That would be too nice. I mean, not nice, but I'm saying it'd be too merciful of a fate, you know, with this m movie and its craziness and cruelty. So Kaylee is now, I'm gonna put an X. Like, she's out of the picture. She is no longer the main character, the main protagonist. It's now Kevin. Now, I want to point out something, even though I'm of the mind that this is happening for real, and this is not like a dream sequence, the jump scare when Kaylee's all faceless, the, the noise that happens, it goes, and it fades out. Dude, when I was a kid, and I'd wake up from nightmares, I, when I'd wake up in the cold sweat, I'd hear that. That's the noise I would hear. Something similar. Or sometimes it'd be like train tracks, like <laughs> The TV depicts a cartoon character opening a whole bunch of doors. I mean, that's pretty easy, right? It's, you know, it's sort of symbolizing the non-Euclidean, topsy-turvy nature of this dimension. Kevin is rummaging through a tin box, probably going to eat his sorrows away or trying to distract himself from the craziness that he just saw. But then the Skinnamarink calls his name and we even see the dropping of like a juice box, he gets he's startled, and then the Skinnamarink tells him to sleep. And then we hear a thud. So Kevin's asleep now at the behest of the Skinnamarink, which kind of frustrates me. First of all, now we know the Skinnamarink has the power to put people to sleep. But like, we're gonna find out later on the reason why the Skinnamarink has harmed Kaylee so badly is because she disobeyed him. But it's like, if, if, if she was such an inconvenience to you, why not just cause her to sleep and transfer her body downstairs? Like, like it's just so evil. The TV now depicts this magical rabbit, Presto Changeo. This magical rabbit has the ability to shapeshift and also the ability to disappear. However, with the help of the analog nature of the VHS, he has an additional power, and that is to reverse time and play it back forward. Reverse time, play it back forward. We see this scene of the Presto Changeo bunny disappearing and then reappearing, disappearing, reappearing, turning back time, doing it again. This is, I believe, to be the motif or the calling card of the Skinnamarink. Okay, so now that we have the Presto Changeo motif established, I want to go over the abilities of the Skinnamarink. I honestly really like the design. That you can someone make like a like an indie horror film and they can call it Brownie Points 2, Revenge of the Brownie. There we go. These are it autofocus isn't on, isn't it? That's fine, because this is more important. The Skinnamarink's powers. Uh, this is not an, uh, a fully exhaustive list, by the way. I must be forgetting something. The ability to teleport people into other realms, create and control these realms. He has the, not only he has the ability to shapeshift himself, but objects and other people. That also basically is power over people's physiology at the end. He has the power of suggestion, as in he can tell you to sleep and you will fall asleep. He can tell you to wake up and you will wake up, but that doesn't work 100% of the time. General magic... That's just to make sure that anything I forgot, you could just throw that under general magic. And then, time control. He has the ability to go forward and backwards in time. The Skinnamarink angrily demands that Kevin plays with him. And then Kevin, the Chad he is, ignores him, or ignores it. We suddenly hear a drawer open in the kitchen. The TV depicts Presto Changeo again. Kevin is suddenly inside the kitchen. And we hear the Presto Changeo motif play just once. And then we hear... Put the knife in your eye. You hear like this noise right before that. I don't think this is supposed to be some grudge like thing or some creepy noise. I think it's like maybe like a safety knife or some sort of like, you know, it just sounds very like box cuttery, you know? We see this half second just shot 
we see it's, it's Kevin just sort of, ah, or like doing some weird noise and like jolting a bit. I think that's supposed to, you know, be him putting the knife in his eye. And then it cuts away. And then we hear the pained sobbing and wailing of Kevin. And we even see blood on the cabinets inside of the kitchen. Things start to go a bit strange, get kind of confusing. Kevin is then told to wake up. I think this is because Kevin must have fainted from the pain, from the trauma. And so he's told to wake up by the skin of a ring, so he does. And um, he goes back to his bed and goes underneath the covers and falls back asleep. And I think this is just the skin of Marine punishing him with the whole knife thing, is punishing him for ignoring him earlier, just how the skin of Marine punished Kaylee for ignoring the skin of Marine's demands. We suddenly see the TV distort. Some sort of entropy is setting in. Things are getting darker, things are changing to be even more shadowy and more non-Euclidean in a way uh, than the pocket dimension we already were in. And so here's what I think is happening. We are being taken to a separate dimension where the skin of Marink is holding Kaylee. We see the top of somebody's head, and then we see the back of who I assume to be Kaylee's head. But the room she's in, she's in the same TV room that Kevin is in, like the same room, but like different dimensions. Kevin is, has the TV on, or Kevin is sleeping, I think, I believe with the TV on, in his pocket dimension, and Kaylee is sit sitting there, I'm assuming still faceless, in a dark room. It just feels different. It's almost like a punishment or a compartment that Kaylee is being held in. Suddenly, Kevin hears the phone make a noise, like a line waiting kind of noise, and it seems he can now make calls. So his first call, the smarty pants he is, is 911. Which, by the way, I want to point out, these kids are so smart. When they find out their dad is missing, first thing they do is call 911. These kids are so smart, and so he's calling 911. And the 911 call is very convincing. I think the dispatcher is an actual person. Maybe the skin of Marink is allowing Kevin to reach out to the outside world giving him this sort of false sense of hope. Because, I mean, after all, what is the dispatcher going to do? What are the cops going to do? They don't have the same interdimensional powers that the skin of rink has. It's also a possibility that this dispatcher is just another fabrication done by the skin of a rink. A long phone call takes place, and then suddenly Kevin drops the phone for some unknown reason. And we see the skin of a rink turn the phone into a toy phone. Kevin asks, how did you do that? And the skin of Marink shows its dastardly hand by laughing this guttural, maniacal cackle. <laughs> we see a scene now, and I, I, I hope I'm not reaching, but this is the first time we see Kevin's face. He's turning, and we see his right eye. I think this is the movie telling us that his eye has been healed, that the consequences of the stabbing in the eye has been reversed. Now, the left eye could still be damaged, maybe, I don't know, but... And so I think Kevin is reacting to his eye being suddenly healed, asking, again, how did you do that? When ju This will make a lot more... I, I feel like this interpretation makes more sense when you juxtapose it with... If, a, a later very traumatic scene, this concept of injuries being reversed and whatnot. The skin of Marine gives an answer this time, describing its reality bending powers. I can do anything. The skin of Marine talks about how it used its powers to punish Kaylee. Suddenly, Kevin is scared. He is now on the ceiling in the hallway. The skin of Marine, in this evil voice, coaxes him to keep going. And we are really just now in this sort of entropic dream realm, everything is just evolving, but Kevin is trekking along, he's walking across the ceiling of the hallway, he makes it to the door, and then we see him, that kind of, I think he turn. we see him look back at the door leading to the hallway, and he's floating away, which is just like, mind-bending. Oh, maybe this is in reference to that previous scene where the kids are floating away into the night sky. He is floating away into this darkness, much like the night sky. Suddenly we have a shot where we can hear Kevin being very fearful. He's being predated upon by these reverberating growls, but then suddenly is transported to safety. Safety being this liminal hallway or space of 
lost bricks, all these toys that were just sort of misplaced and whatnot. We even see that red tape player from the beginning of the movie in this stash of, of bricks and whatnot. And instead of being jump scared by an image or a noise, we get jump scared with a fact. 572 days. Kevin and Kaylee have been in this nightmare for two birthdays. And so I, Kevin has been in that toy place, what I think to be the Skinamarink's like toy box, for two birthdays. And Kaylee in that d dark pocket dimension for two birthdays. But it seems the Skinamarink wants to play again. We see Kevin almost being pulled out of this toy box, this little liminal space. We also see Kaylee in her pocket room fading out. But the way she's fading out is so strange to me. It's not just like a, a fade. It's like a, a, a bottom to up wiping motion. By the way, does this look familiar to you? The style of which she's disappearing reminds me so much of Presto Changeo, and I do not know what to make of that. Nonetheless, Kevin is being pulled out of a toy box and Kaylee is being pulled out of this sort of hell to reunite the two siblings. This part still perplexes me. We see two sets of baby pictures. We see some baby pictures showing a faceless baby, which this should obviously symbolize or denote Kaylee, but then we also see a baby without a head, a headless baby. And naturally our brain wants to fill in the blank with, well then somehow that's gotta mean Kevin. And I'm really trying to wrap my head around this. If the faceless baby is Kaylee, and the headless baby is Kevin, maybe it's supposed to symbolize how Kaylee's face has sort of blurred over. He's losing memory of her. Mind you, this has been two birthdays they've spent away from each other, away from their home realm. And perhaps if the headless baby is Kevin, maybe it's supposed to symbolize Kevin either like going crazy, losing his head, or it could symbolize Kevin's loss of identity. I'm also thinking that all of these pictures will be pictures of Kaylee. Maybe this is Kevin being shown pictures of Kaylee by the Skinamarink, and some of them are a faceless Kaylee, which is a reference to her punishment uh, without, you know, having her face stolen from her. And maybe the headless pictures of Kaylee, if we are to believe that these are pictures of Kaylee, are referencing a scene that's going to happen shortly. <sighs> okay. So we see a small bit of blood splatter. And then we hear some strange murmurings and then Kaylee's screaming. And then suddenly a big splash of blood and the presto changeo motif plays and then things reverse. And it's back to that one initial splatter of blood. And then the same thing happens again, the murmuring and then Kaylee's screaming. Presto changeo motif plays again, it reverses. The skin of rink is unkilling Kaylee and then killing her again. The same thing happens again, but this time you can hear this detestable smug chortle that the, the skin of Marink is, is, is giving off. And, and, and then you just hear, like, you, can, you don't even, you barely hear it. You can, but you can see on the subtitle, mommy. Maybe it's Kaylee calling out for her mom as she's being subjected to this damnation of torture. I mean, a fate worse than death, truly. And the fact that this beast is finding entertainment, like how we find entertainment with playing with dolls and playing with Legos and playing with the Barbies and stuff, this, this skin of Marink gains entertainment from killing and unkilling and killing and unkilling and killing a child, an innocent child. I, they gotta make a skin of Marink too, where you know, John Rambo comes and cuts him his head off and then saves the two kids and they go to therapy and they, you know, cope with it and then, but they live off, you know, to cure cancer and solve world hunger. That's my head cannon. You see, I think what happened, Kaylee was in her pocket realm and Kevin was in his sort of toy box pocket realm and the Skinamarink thought, because thought, you, you've done this before with your toys, right? You take Batman in one toy box, you take Barbie in the other toy box and you inter have them interact. It's almost like the skin of Marink has taken Kaylee from one box and then Kevin from the other box and is having them interact again, but he's, he's, he's torturing Kaylee and having Kevin react to it.
Now we're going to break down what I believe to be the various dimensions and realms that the skin of Marine has control over and where each child is located and whatnot. So I believe in the beginning of the movie we were in the home dimension. And then during that scene where after the scene where the father falls asleep and we see Kaylee walking through the hallway all creeped out and whatnot, we are in the skin of Marine's dimension. The first layer, if you will. Kaylee gets punished and gets sent to the dark pocket dimension. And then later on, the skin of Marink, when he tells Kevin to be like, oh, keep going. First, they take a detour to like a scary pocket dimension. I'm of the mind that those scary reverberating growls are not of the skin of Marink. I think the skin of Marink is taking him through like straight up the back rooms. Preferably the wiki dot one. And then we land in the toy box dimension, which then both Kevin, at which point both Kevin and Kaylee are both in there for 572 years, I believe, two birthdays, and then they're taken to either two places. After that scene where they get pulled out of their respective pocket dimensions, they're either in back at the original Skinamarink dimension or they are in the screening room, something I call the screening room, where we are seeing him torture Kaylee and um, making Kevin watch the torture. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a break. I'm gonna take a freaking break, all right? Yeah, I'm sorry, gentlemen. I'm, I'm gonna take a freaking break, all right? Sorry. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I get where he's coming from, but it's, he doesn't see the full picture. He only probably sees half of it, if that, honestly. We are taken away from this horrid scene, and Kevin utters Kaylee's name. He remembers her. And then he asks, can we just watch something happy? And the Skinner Marink, I think, obliges. We hear heavenly music. We see this sort of scene, this tableau, if you will, and we see a door. I don't think this is artsy fartsy BS. I think the Skinnamarink is actually showing Kevin something happy. You see, imagine being in Kevin's shoes. Imagine being in Kaylee's shoes. Imagine being in these children's shoes. For two birthdays, you have been stolen away from your realm. There's no food, there's no joy, there's nothing to do. You're just stuck in this toy box. This dark, twisted, demented, nightmarish toy box. Nothing will make you happy. Nothing will give you any sort of joy. However, there's one thing. One thing that symbolizes some sort of modicum of hope. And that is what I believe to be the front door that disappeared on that fateful night. I think the skin of a rink actually gave it its best effort to show something happy, really the only thing that could possibly have happiness or hope or joy inside of it, to Kevin. But it doesn't matter. It's a facade. The skin of Marink isn't letting Kevin leave, but is showing him something happy. And now, one of the creepiest moments in the entire movie, we see darkness. And up until this point, every time we see something, we realize it's just our eyes playing a trick on us. You look in the corner of darkness, you look in a little ajar door, the, you know, that, that shadowy void. Did I see something? Nah, that's just the graininess playing tricks on my eyes. Well, this time, that little shape forming on the left side of the screen, that's for real. 
That's for real. And it comes in and it comes in and you're like, uh-uh. Uh-uh, that's a face. That's a face. And, and, and I can even make out a smile. I can even make out the eyes. Remember how earlier I was asking if the picture, that obscured dark photo of the mom looked familiar? I, I, I honestly wonder if this is like the skin of a rink trying to get a mom face going, you know? That's regardless, it's, you know. Anyways, the fattest fake out of all time. I was expecting a jump scare. The skin of a rink is peering over, is peering over the, uh, Kevin and tells him to go to sleep. Kevin asks twice, what is your name? What is your name? And then the movie ends. On not my third rewatch, but on editing and going through the movie and all the various scenes, I noticed at the very end, Kevin asks twice, what is your name? What is your name? And the response we get from the movie is the end. Is this supposed to be... If I'm going to interpret this as the response to Kevin's question, that maybe this face that we see is supposed to be death personified, then that would go against my theory of this being a never-ending torturous realm. It does come to a merciful conclusion, if you can call it that, really, merciful. And if that's the case, it could very well be that that face that we see at the end is not of the skin of Marine but actually some sort of angel of mercy or death or whatever. And that would almost kind of make sense because if you remember earlier on that blurry, obscured photo of what I believe to be the mom reminded me so much of that final obscure face in the ending, maybe that's like the mom coming back. And no, because the problem is that creature says, go to sleep. And it sounds just like a skin of it's, it's the skin of Marink. It's the skin of Marink. That's all. It's just is this the that's nah, no. That's just saying the end. It's just the movie saying the end, and it just we never get the name. The name is Skin of Marink. What's your name? I'm the Skin of Marink. But hey, listen. If you are of the mind that this is a coma dream, and eventually it ends in Kevin's death, then that's perfect. That's the ending right there. What is your name? The end. I'm the angel of death also known as the skin of Marink. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing in a lot of levity because this movie did really affect me. I want to say for like about a week, my psyche was just being eaten at by this movie. You see, when I was first walking out of the movie theaters, I was impressed with the movie. I liked it. It was good. And then after time kept passing, it got better. Because I was thinking about it, and I kept thinking about it. I kept thinking about that blood splatter scene. I kept thinking about how merciless this entire fate and ordeal was for these two innocent children. And it's just, why? Why make a movie about this? Because these people are geniuses. And it, it truly ate away at my psyche for about a week. Now, does that mean my taste in movies is oversimplified? Am I just a big, sensitive fucking baby that needs to just... Grow a pair. Yes, but that's not the point. You see, when I was watching this movie, I was in the middle of watching a whole bunch of baby videos with my sisters. So already I was very vulnerable to this sort of feeling of nostalgia and the innocence of childhood. And it doesn't help that I was born in the mid-90s. So, I mean, like, this image, I mean, these images and, and, and the house looked so much like the house I grew up in. I guess that's why I was very receptive to it and very sensitive to its very specific tone. You know, in the beginning of this video, I was drawing a lot of parallels and references to this concept of nostalgia. And while I still do believe that it sets the stage for nostalgia and you're kind of taking in all that 90s Kino, it really chucks that out the window and it becomes real more about just a merciless, cruel story about how dangerous and how traumatizing it could be as a child to be abandoned, to not be seen and watched. We do see these themes early on in the movie of the father not being present for his children, only being there during perceived emergencies. And so... 
even if my theory is correct, which I'm not even sure if it is, I think that my literalistic interpretation of the movie might be in the minority, and it's more likely that it's a dream sequence and whatnot, because that's what the short that this is based off of Heck is more explicitly about. I think in both interpretations, there is this consequence of lack of presence in parenting and how damaging it could be for a child. It makes sense that it's so cruel. It makes sense that it's so brutal. Because which, who is an un, what demographic is more undeserving of this cruel fate than children? Did I word that right? I'm trying to say that there is no demographic that's... Bad things should not happen to kids. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I believe that the unorthodox means of telling the story was a feature of this movie because you would not be able to depict what was happening to Kaylee, what was happening to Kevin in a very explicit, clear way. If he did, this would be like a rated X movie. This would be a banned movie. So you need to tell the story in a very implicit way, in a very read-between-the-lines way, and I think that softens the blow a little bit to allow you to think rather to be than rather be shocked. You know, if you saw this actually happening, you'd be like, oh my gosh, how dare you? How, how, how dare you depict, depict such images? But when it's told in a very implicit way, you're like, no, oh, that can't, that's happening? Is that happening right now? I think that's the difference. Both examples are equally cruel, but because one is done in an implicit way, it's, it's more tasteful. I'm, this is going to be abrupt, but I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm done rambling because I have to edit all of this. Thank you for watching. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed. I hope I helped make sense of this crazy movie. And, and I, hope, I hope it confused you because the more confused you were by this movie, the more value you got out of my video. That's my goal. So, thank you for watching. Hope to see you next time. Or, more likely, I hope you see me next time because this was quite the undertaking. Ha, ha, ha.